Well, the title Sublime Point refers to a place in the, uh, in the Illawarra on the escarpment. When we were conceiving of the exhibition, it seemed like an appropriate title to use, given that the sublime is such, or has been such an integral part of the way that artists have looked at the landscape. From my point of view, we were always going to have a very wide vision. And so to me, the sublime point, it's, it's a popular lookout spot, and so it's a panoramic vision. And I thought that that fitted well with the concept of the exhibition, that it was going to be a panorama of contemporary painting where artists use the landscape. We tried to get artworks that were no more than two years old. That means that they're pretty fresh and some of the artworks were actually made for the exhibition. Two or three of them have just been made by the artists for the show. We're also looking at the pleasures that paint gives and what kinds of strategies artists are taking up with paint in this day and age. After all, painting has been around for a very long time and, and one could ask oneself what relevance does painting have to our contemporary society you know, in terms of a form of expression, given that there are all kinds of other ways you could express yourself these days that might seem more contemporary than painting. The name of this painting is called Bow, and it comes from a series of work to do with eucalypt trees, and I've called the body of work Eucalypt, and it's really about our memories and history, and we all have a kind of story about, or feeling for eucalypt trees. The whole reason that I paint and make work the way I do is because of the way I think and feel about landscape, and that's come about from my kind of conversation with Aboriginal painting from the middle 90s, probably early 90s, and what I started doing was thinking about how Indigenous people in this country saw land, and once you take those ideas on board, not copying their work, but thinking about how they see country, it makes you reconsider how you see Western painting. And what I mean by that is the way that we were trained in a Western way to see foreground, midground, background in a painting. And a lot of Aboriginal painting does not have that. It can be maps, it can be aerial views, or it can be macro and micro. So my conversation painting-wise has been how do I make pictures about that idea, all those ideas, for the last 15 years. And that's why this painting really doesn't have foreground, midground, background. It's much flatter space. And it's a close-up of things too, which a lot of Aboriginal painting can be as well. Close-ups and story as well. It's, the, it's really important to point out that even though the work looks incredibly abstract, it's come from drawings that I've made from real life, from little structures that I've made from gum leaves, or actually shadows from the gum leaves or the tree itself. So I'll make a whole bunch of drawings. Firstly, they'll go up in the studio and then I'll construct the painting from those drawings. So the green for me is evocative of eucalypts, the smell, even gumdrops. We all have, kids have memories of eating those eucalypt lollies, those gum lollies, and that kind of the pink and the green, because they're kind of uplifting, positive kind of colour, they have that feeling for me, those memories for me. When I was developing this exhibition with Graham, I immediately wanted to include a work by artists from the Chala community, particularly the Ken sisters. And so I contacted the art centre manager, Sky O'Meara, and I asked if they would be interested in being part of the exhibition and particularly working on a collaborative work together. And so this was the work that came out of that collaborative process. Um, if you're looking at the work, you can see a number of the different artist styles in the work as well. An interesting story that came out of the work which the art centre manager relayed to me was that the artists became very competitive when they were producing the work. They were each working on a particular area of the canvas and wanting to outdo each other with the use of colour, the fine dotting or the more innovative style. Chala's the pigeon jar word for honey ant and jukapa is the pigeon jar word for creation. But it's not just about this idea of the dreaming or creation stories, it's about a law and the way that the people interact with the land. Um, it's also about religion and philosophy. Daniel Boyd's work is called Untitled and it is an image that shows Mount Vesuvius exploding 
An image that was in fact uh, made originally by Andy Warhol back in 1985. For Warhol it might have been a, a kind of ironic statement about the kind of rhetoric associated with creativity, the, the explosiveness that some people associate with their inspiration, etc. Boyd has taken what seems to me to be a, a, another kind of ironic or pointing to a, another irony about Warhol's work itself. Warhol famously talks about the 15 minutes of fame. But Boyd has put archival glue all over it, which suggests to me that Boyd is, uh, is looking at that idea, that historical idea of the pop culture, that somehow it's you know going to be uh, quickly digested and move on, whereas in fact of course all those things are collected and they're part of museums, they're part of the iconography of art history. He perhaps is also looking at how we see the past and what kind of lenses, uh, I think is a term that's used in reference to his use of these resin dots, and what kind of lenses we look through when we look back to the past and our relationship to it. M.H. Tiller's work is called Kosciuszko and typically it's painted on prefabricated, fairly cheap, stretched canvas panels that one might associate with amateur artists, not one of Australia's leading contemporary painters. So there uh, is a range of panels which I guess if they all fell off the wall would no longer be a painting. In minimalism, um, art was often meant to be prefabricated and detached from the artist. And around the edge of his work he has the quotation from the title of a Stéphane Mallarmé poem. Mallarmé was one of the people who developed the idea of concrete poetry um, and he was interested in the look of words and the sound of words as much as he was interested in what the words might mean. And I think there are layers and layers of meanings across Tiller's work. The iconic image of Kosciuszko which other painters have painted. So in a sense I think the viewer can play a kind of word image game for themselves and construct all kinds of ideas uh, about the work that uh, may be in Tiller's mind or maybe not. James Dodd is interested in the everyday scratches and scrawls that we find in public spaces, from toilet blocks and school desks to bus shelters and park benches. This work combines images of the landscape and the scrawled text found at Groot Island, where Dodd travelled to earlier this year to undertake a residency. For Dodd, an artist who has spent a lot of time involved with street art and graffiti outcomes, the scrawled marks and texts are as exciting to discover as the spectacular landforms of a particular region. He's trying to tell us more about the people that actually live there. It's not just about a particular location, it's about the people that inhabit it. And in a way, the scratches and scrawlings that he collects in these landscapes are, are almost um, anthropological. I guess it's, it's a way of looking at history about people making their mark. Noel McKenna's work is called Australia Back to Front. It's a peculiar thing when you first see it because you immediately know what it is. You know that it is Australia and you suddenly realise that it's back to front. It's a very incisive wit here because when we think about our sense of nationhood, if we think about nationalism, it's very much constructed around an image of Australia, um, what that place is. And here we have a map that's back to front, and yet we know what it is, pointing something out to us that we might take on board, I think, when we start getting a little bit nationalistic. This work is titled De Beer To Be Country. It's by Sally Gabori. And Sally Gabori is from Mornington Island, which is located in the Gulf of Carpentaria. And Sally's quite interesting in that she took up painting in 2005 at the age of around 81. And loved paint, loved the colour of paint, loved the immediacy of paint and loved what she could be doing with paint. And all of her works are about De Beer To Be Country. It's where Sally was born in 1924 and she lived on the island until 1948 where due to environmental and social issues she had to move along with all the other people from Bentick Island to Mornington Island. And as a result there was a deep, I guess a deep longing for country. And that's something that you can see in a lot of her work. Of this work, the artist has said, this is my husband's country, 
on Bentinck Island. Near the coast, there is a large salt pan that covers a large part of his country. There are mangrove swamps and rock outcrops scattered across the salt pan. David Ralph's work's called Campsite. When I first saw the work, I was struck, first of all, by the quality of the painting. It's a, it's a very well-painted work. There's this very ambiguous situation. Is this person inside looking out, or are they outside with some kind of odd interior around them? The other thing that interested me was that he combined a kind of realism, which, to my mind, brought to my mind uh, social realism, but he combines it with a very abstract walls of paint. So there was another interesting contradiction. This dear friend of mine, Roy Jackson, who was very unwell, we've spent a lot of time in the last year with him, sitting on the back of his deck in the bush at Wedderburn where he lived, um, looking out into the bush, which he loved very much where he lived and was a landscape painter, I guess, himself. Um, and we would talk about the flickering light through this beautiful, dense, rather dry bush. I've always worked with, for a long time now, not always, probably the last six or seven years, with, with the roller. It lends itself so generously to the line. I use my hands, I go straight into the pot, I put the colour onto the roller, and then just see what wonderful, unexpected colours happen by just sort of very, you know, quickly and very gesturally rolling it onto the board. Uh, the paintings get washed off many, many times. So um, when I say many times, in one day I'll be working on a painting and you know, wash it off you know, 10, 15 times. But each time it's washed off, there'll be reminiscence left because it'll be also done quickly and haphazardly because I like the element of surprise. Painting for me is not something that I want to get caught in the conscious. I mean, I'm guided a lot by my intuition with painting. Tony Clark's work is 12 panels from his Miriorama or Clark's Miriorama. When we say Clark's Miriorama, we don't mean Tony's, we mean the Clark that lived in the 18th century, I think it was, who developed the Miriorama as a children's game. It, it's a series of cards on which there are landscape images that depict very romantic or classical landscape images. They really are popular culture from a century or so ago. So they could be arranged endlessly. And in fact, he apparently feels that the curators or owners or others who, who put up his work can indeed take it upon themselves to put them any way they like. Mark Rodders has two works in the exhibition. Rodder is known for, in the past, for works that um, are of no specific place. They're amalgams of imaginative or visited places or memories of places that he created into landscapes. In this show, we have a work which Rodder has said is a kind of meditation on the processes of nature. A Leviathan is something monstrous. In this work, we see a white tree or plant that Mark suggests is benevolent in the sense that it's giving back to its environment as much as it has taken from it. There is always with his work, to my mind, some air of the mythical. The way the works are painted, they recall to me paintings that we might look at in, in Flemish Renaissance work where there's often myths and fables. And these two works, even though one of them is quite representational of a particular place, does seem to still have that air of the mythical or slight mystery about it. So this is my painting Ascension of a Log, which um, was commissioned particularly for this show but on the other hand, it is part of a broader series that I'm doing, which is called Cordelia Fool, which is sort of a series that sets King Lear in northern New South Wales. Um, and usually my landscapes are activated by figures, but in this case, the sort of figures aren't there. So Cordelia's not there, the fool's not there, the maid's not there, so these characters in Lear aren't there. And instead, the, the log is the hero. 
What my idea is, is that I want people to read the painting in quite a multiple sort of ways. So on one hand, they can see something that looks like a backdrop. I think in this painting particularly, something I'm looking at is just as, it's as if it's a backdrop to King Lear, you know, and that the actors could come on at any moment. You know, it's not necessarily to, supposed to be a direct representation of the landscape that I sit in front of and try and realistically appraise. But on the other hand, it is very much of a place. So, you know, the, you know, the Banksias that are there, the heath in the background, that's very much of that place but I make the place into something a little bit more fantastical at the same time. Joanna Lamb lives in suburban Perth and often the images that she uses in her work are taken from her immediate environment. She also takes images from real estate brochures, websites and magazines. She then uses a drawing-based program to reduce the images down to their basic components, to basic blocks of colour and shape. The work is very similar to a screen print and that it looks almost untouched by the human hand. But this isn't so. Joanna actually hand paints all of the work. She projects the image onto the canvas and then paints all of the work by hand. But the brush strokes are so precise that they're almost invisible. Stephen Bush's work is called Furthered. The colours that he uses are, are very high keyed and not realistic at all, quite acidic kinds of colours. So it has a sense of unreality about it, although the image could be based originally in some real scene. For me, this is a, a kind of a, a, a very postmodern image where we have the combinations of things that are disparate elements taken from all kinds of sources and put together not necessarily to make sense, certainly not immediate sense. It's a very enigmatic image and, and I think it's one that draws you in and makes you start to ask questions about what could possibly be going on here. To some extent maybe the peasant is looking to some future and perhaps the machinery is representative of that future that he might or we might never have. Kate's works are simultaneously sublime and toxic. They're not just a landscape, but a landscape of paint. In terms of talking about this exhibition as an exhibition about painting, I think Kate has one of the most interesting techniques in the exhibition. She's the only artist that isn't painting directly onto the canvas. So she's creating the paint skins first and then layering the paint skins onto the canvas to create the work. So the mountainous forms that we see in the work are created from fragments of paint. Philip Wolfhagen's work is called Third Proposition, which to me has a kind of philosophical ring about it. Propositions are, I guess, are things that we put forward um, when we want to discuss ideas. This work has almost no image in it at all. So when we look at it, we kind of register landscape, but no particular landscape at all. It's very atmospheric in that sense. It reminds me again of Dutch landscape painting where there's always a very defined horizon line, but I, I thought also it, it's a little bit orientalist. It's on three separate canvases and each canvas is divided in half in a scroll-like image and uh, there is that sense of the void, what we're looking into. Wolfhagen apparently refers to himself as a perceptual artist, not a conceptual artist. And it struck me that um, the proposition might be what are we looking at when we look at representations of things made of paint? Is he asking us you know, to consider how does paint create something for us to look at um, in comparison to the thing that it might represent. I've spent many years surfing and it's through the surfing that I've had been able to witness the landscape in many different weather conditions and that's been a you know, real sort of blessing to me. This panel is looking at Sublime Point from the ocean looking north this is looking at Sublime Point from the ocean, looking south. I'm, I'm not an, an, an Indigenous Australian, but I feel deeply connected to the land 
um, in my own way. And I've, I've wondered why. Possibly the darkness is a, is a reference to some of the darker things that have occurred in the landscape. This is a beautiful Portuguese word, which I'll probably pronounce wrong, it's saudade. And it pertains to a certain sort of melancholy, a sadness, a longing for something that is lost, but not necessarily something you can put your finger on or put a word to it, but just a sense of that there was a loss and you left with this sort of, sort of, this gentle melancholy. And I get that from the landscape. And so that's really, this painting is my visual interpretation of Saudad and, and uh, my, my feelings towards the land and what's happened in the land. Um, I particularly love the work of Churchill Khan. I find him one of the most innovative Indigenous artists working in the Warman area, which is in the East Kimberley area in Western Australia. Um, he's not just an artist, but he's also a traditional medicine man, um, a role that was passed on to him from his father. What I love about his work is the way that he uses ochre on canvas and he waters the ochre down so that it's, it's almost like a watercolour and he's creating or recreating the topography of his traditional country. And when you're looking at the work, it's, it's almost like you're looking at the way the mountains have been made. So it's almost like looking at this amazing creation story. And when I look at the work, like I, I, I feel like I'm almost transported there, like I'm almost flying over the mountains. Caroline lives in Bruny Island in Tasmania and her studio now faces west, northwest and looks directly into the mountains in southern Tasmania. Um, it's quite an amazing work in that it is quite large and when you, you do stand in front of it you feel like you're almost there looking at these incredible windswept mountains. It's almost like this force of nature is coming into the gallery. And then looking at that next to Churchill Carnes, you you're looking at like the creation stories and the way the mountains have actually been made. And then if you go from, from Churchill Carnes and then you're looking at someone like Alexander Mackenzie's, you wouldn't usually think to put some, like an ochre on canvas next to someone that's working with, you know, Dutch traditions of rabbit skin glue and lead white paint, but they just work. There's, there's the power in the image. It's, you, you look at Alexander's and it's almost like the heavens are opening up. And then, and then you move on to Churchill's and it's, it's almost like the way that the land has been created. This one is called In the Arboretum. The Arboretum being a tree nursery where uh, uh, trees are grown, fostered um, and, and looked after. So the, the idea of trees being nurtured and grown and, and becoming mature is is an overriding symbol um, for the way we think about or I think about your own self and your own soul that you need to nurture, look after, grow, feed, water yourself as a person, as an individual. There's a lot of different symbols in this particular one. Um, most obviously there is the, the path which is in this case it's a very clear, defined path, illuminated from above, but it's leading into a lot of unknown. So the, the symbol being the story, the narrative, is that quite often we're given a very clear path, illuminated by a very distinct light in this case. Uh, but when we follow it and when we go along life's journey, we end up in uh, a sometimes a difficult place and a lot of um, uh, a lot of craggy bushes, brambles, a lot of a lot of darkness, a lot of hidden things and I, I, I guess I'm telling a story really about my own experience of, of uh, life in this picture here. When we're putting the show together, of course, one of my interests was the notion of the Australian landscape, which is so strong in Australian painting. I look at the works and what I became interested in was how, especially perhaps the younger artists, don't have that sense of place as strongly as uh, perhaps my generation did even. 
and prior generations have certainly had. For me, it suggests that identity has become much more fluid. The younger artists in particular are not so focused on the, uh, the nation or the place that they're living in. They, they reflect, I guess, the kinds of sources of information they get, which come from everywhere and uh, they incorporate that into their work and so their sense of identity is not so uh, caught up in, um, in a particular locality. They are cosmopolitan as the word is, meaning that they um, are people of the whole world in some sense.